Okay, tell me when. Okay. That's a win. That's more than a win. That's too much. That's more than a win. That's an overflowing win. You know, I can't drink all of that. I mean, I, I may be two-thirds water, but I, I don't want to become four-fifths water, and I would be if I drank all of that. And you know what? It's easy to pour back. Yeah, well, not surprised. It's a liquid. I think we're going to need a towel here. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. We value building materials that are strong and resilient. Bridges work best, after all, when they stay erect. But some computers may work better when made with liquids. Materials that flow offer all sorts of novel building opportunities, and biology couldn't exist without fluids. Consider what your heart is pumping through your vascular system right now. The thing is, liquids also defy precise definition. Is tar a solid or liquid? What about peanut butter? In this episode, a cascade of watery, runny, molten, gluey, gummy, syrupy materials that do everything from generate the Earth's magnetic field, make life possible, provide armor for insects, and give us the concept of ballpoint penness. All in all, liquids do us a real solid. So let's go with the flow. Material scientist Mark Miodovnik must have the patience of a chess tournament referee. After all, how else do you explain how the University College London professor is able to sit and sit and sit and watch the behavior of tar? Although, to be fair, this is petroleum-based productivity. His higher purpose is to come up with ways to improve city infrastructure. I'm researching how we can make cities self-heal. And you might think, well, well, that sounds crazy. But if you look into the future and to global warming and, and much bigger storms and floods, you know, it makes total sense that our infrastructure, our roads, our tunnels, our bridges, we're going to want them to heal themselves. And when we started researching the roads, we realized that they already heal themselves. That's an extraordinary thing, that the tar on the roads is actually a liquid. And when a big truck goes over it and you get a tiny crack formed, that crack heals itself. But had you asked him prior to his asphalt attentions whether tar was a solid or a liquid, he'd say that he couldn't say. And that stumper prompted the author of the book Stuff Matters, which was about the mainly solid materials that make up our lives, to investigate its runnier cousins, liquids. He discovered that they defy a definite definition. Yet liquids matter too. Not only would our lives not flow smoothly without them, we ignore their potential power at our peril. Liquids in the form of tidal waves or storm flooding can be the most destructive and deadly forms of matter on Earth. Liquid, the delightful and dangerous substances that flow through our lives, is Dr. Miodovnik's latest book. And he doesn't skimp on the delightful part, whether it's the viscous smart materials being shaped into future computers or the surprising properties of the ink flowing from a ballpoint pen. That ink's operation leads us into a discussion of Newtonian physics. And yet, after careful study of the morphable material of our streets, to the sticky contents in his refrigerator, to the malleable alloys found in computer labs, this material scientist could not come up with a solid definition of a liquid. You've hit upon something that is slightly awkward for someone like me who's written a book about liquids, which is that there isn't, after all this, a definition I can stand by. As you say, you know, in school we're told that there are these hard and fast categories of matter. But I should really say, instead of saying liquid, I should say something behaves like a liquid. Because it's shifty. You know, some things are solids and they behave like a liquid. Some things are liquids and they behave like a solid. It all comes down to how long you look at them for. So the tar on the roads I was just talking about, if you can look at it all day, you won't see it move, really, you know. But it moves over several days and it does depend on the temperature. So it's very, very viscous. On the other hand, we know there are some things that seem incredibly solid, like the crust of the earth, <laughs> and they move over, you know, months and uh, years. But if you really want to say to someone, well, a liquid is this, the best definition I've got so far is that it will flow into a container and assume the shape of that container because gases will flow, but they won't assume a shape and solids 
you know, they can they can flow over long periods of time, but they, they generally don't assume the shape of a container. What about peanut butter? Well, peanut butter is a liquid. Um, it's, you know, when you buy peanut butter, you can see it because it has flowed into that container and taken the shape of it. And if you leave it around for a while, it will the, the top will flatten after you've taken a big scoop of it, delicious stuff. So it's a liquid. And also, if you really want to know what a definition of a liquid is, just try and get it through airport security. They, they seem to have a very clear idea of what a liquid is. And they say peanut butter is a liquid. <laughs> well, it's also dangerous, at least to your teeth. Well... Well, well, let me ask you this. I mean, from the standpoint of uh, looking at these substances from a, I don't know, a molecular point of view, now I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the way certain substances form crystals, maybe like salt. You know, you have sodium and chlorine atoms, and, and they're all, you know, in this lattice form. They're in this very regular structure, which I think allows them to hold on to one another very tightly, and as a result, it doesn't flow uh, whereas a gas, they're not really holding on to one another at all. I mean, are, are liquids just everything in the middle where they're sort of holding on but not terribly tightly? I think exactly that's right, that liquids are somewhere in the middle of being a gas and basically being dominated by the thermal motion, the kinetic energy of the individual atoms and molecules. Whereas solids, the behavior is much more of a collective if you pull one bit of a solid, the rest of it generally comes with it. <laughs> you know, you pick up the handle of your cup and it's a solid, so the rest of the cup comes with it. <laughs> but liquids are not like that. You know, if you take a bit of water, then the rest of the water just stays put. You seem to delight in the non-Newtonian properties of the ballpoint pen. I've got one in my hand here. Uh, what is meant by non-Newtonian? It sounds like something that shouldn't be allowed. Well, it's kind of annoying, you know, that a Newtonian is a statement of everything that should be right about the universe, Newton. <laughs> when Newton went round, you know, we thought we understood the universe. And ever since then, it's sort of been downhill, hasn't it? It's got more and more complicated. And that's true of descriptions of liquid, because, you know, you can think of a liquid as flowing into a container or down a hill, and, and we're all happy with that, and however fast it happens. But then it turns out to be more complicated than that, because some things will flow, and when you increase the pressure on them or the forces on them, they flow faster. And they just do that at a proportional rate, like water does that. But some things don't do that. They will hardly flow at all until you put some pressure on, and then they become incredibly runny. <laughs> and vice versa, you get some things that are very runny and liquidy, but if you put them under pressure, they become very solid-like. So the very good example of that is a mixture of corn flour and water, a non-Newtonian behavior, because you can mix it with a spoon gently and it behaves like a liquid. But then if you punch the top of it, it will resist you and it will behave like a solid. And that's non-Newtonian. Well, well, let's get back to that ballpoint pen just for a moment, because that's a case where you put pressure on it and it, and it becomes more runny. So what's happening when you put that ballpoint pen to paper? I mean, it's such an ingenious thing, the ballpoint pen. I think writing the book, I was in such awe of Laszlo Biro, who, who designed it, because he was struggling with the fact that he wanted to use printing ink. He thought printing would be much better ink to use for writing, but it's very sticky. And you can't put it in a reservoir and hope it will flow down to a nib of a pen. What to do, he thought. Well, if it's non-Newtonian, then if you some, put some pressure on it via the ball... <laughs> it becomes runny, and he discovered this. And so it runs around the ball and onto the page, but then as soon as it's on the page, the pressure's off, and it immediately kind of solidifies and becomes all stuck. <laughs> and so the thing is about that is that it's a very efficient way of getting ink out of a reservoir onto a piece of paper and for it to stick there. And that is the essence of penness. I got to say, that is genius. I mean, it makes me think of zippers, which I, you know, took a long time to understand how a zipper worked. But the thing that I've never figured out is who could have come up with that in the first place? I never thought about ballpoint pens. I know. And I think that the thing about liquids that I really found fascinating writing this book was that we're constantly trying to control them because they have so much power to offer us. You know, they have the ability to power our aircraft and our cars. They have the ability to kind of make these incredible pens. They have the ability to make liquid crystal displays for our mobile phones and our laptops. And yet, they're always slightly rebelling against us. You know, in the case of a pen, it suddenly sprouts a leak at an inopportune moment and it's all over your hands <laughs> and your clothes. 
Or in the case of a screen, you drop it badly and all of a sudden the whole thing goes haywire. Uh, and in the case of fuel, well, we know what happens when it goes haywire with fuel. You know, everyone dies. So liquids are this kind of amazing thing. They're powerful but dangerous. And that's what I wanted to capture in the book. What makes them dangerous? Yeah, well, now, if you go back in time, of course, historically, if you were a king or an emperor, the liquids you would be fearing were poisons because, you know, that was the easiest way to get rid of someone in power who you didn't want to be in power. You just slip a little bit of poison. You don't need very much of some poisons into their wine and they take a sip and they're gone. And then we have the voluntary poisons, which we imbibe, m many people imbibe every day, socially, which is beer and wine and vodka and all the spirits, because in there is alcohol. And alcohol, in the form that we drink it, is mostly ethanol, and that's a poison. That'll poison you, does poison us all. In fact, it's the poisoning that makes us feel relaxed. <laughs> We're sort of disabling part of our system voluntarily. That's hence the word intoxication. It's toxic to your body, <laughs> and you are intoxicated. So we willingly take those, and we kind of poison ourselves. So chemically, there's a lot of very dangerous liquids out there. But then you go the other the other side of the coin and you, and you look at magma, you know, the liquid inside the earth. And when that comes up, <laughs> it is devastating, you know, heat and it produces lots of ash. And then, of course, let's not forget the sea. I mean, this enormous liquid that we rely on, it stabilizes our climate. We're completely reliant on it. But the biggest natural disasters are all liquids, you know, floods, tsunamis, hurricanes. You know, liquids are very destructive things. When a liquid flows, Mark, uh, I'm, I'm thinking maybe of milk that you spill or raw egg that spreads over your countertop. What's going on at the molecular level? What's, what's the definition of flow here? Yeah, you know, it all depends on how the molecules are attracted to each other, which is not always the same mechanism in all liquids. So that's the slight complication here. So in the case of water, right, we've all spilt water. <laughs> These are tiny molecules, H2O molecules. They're polar, so they are attracted to each other. But they, by and large, will flow past each other very easily. And so water is very Newtonian, it behaves itself, and it has a very low viscosity, i.e. the forces to push the molecules past each other are not high. So this thing called viscosity, the thickness of how easy is it, that is to do with the molecular forces between the molecules in that liquid. Now, if you have long chain molecules, you can imagine that they stick to each other better and flow less easily. And now think of the oil in your kitchen. Some oil, which is long chain carbon molecules, flows like a very slow glug, 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 right? <laughs> and it's viscous in your hands. It's the same as putting oil on you for suntan lotion. Embedded in those experience of viscosity is this molecular structure. It really does sound that liquids play an outsized role in our lives. I mean, even though we try to go with the flow, I guess. The future of some material science seems to be in liquids, too. Uh, you write about the coming of liquid computers... And uh, I have to say, I, I saw a liquid computer. It, was, it ran on water, actually, at a science fair back in the seventh grade. So that's a long time ago. And, you know, lots of glass tubing and valves and so forth. W what do you mean by a, you know, liquid computer? Well, I think the first thing to say about this, because it does sound a bit weird and unnecessary, let's say, is that our cells, in some ways, you might describe as little mini liquid computers. I mean, they are making calculations. They are taking in sense data and they are then acting on that and that's all happening in the liquid state so it's clearly possible and dna that's how it's working in our cells dna is the molecule that that therefore relies on it's an incredible molecule and the advantage of doing things in the liquid state is you can do things in parallel massively parallel and of course we are examples of that you know billions and trillions of calculations in our cells all the time making us work the way we do. So the attraction, therefore, is A, that you know, you're doing things at a molecular scale, so the miniaturization possibilities are large. B, you've got this massive paralyzation if you get it right. And so the miniaturization, speed, these are all on the cards. If you look to the future, coming back to my research about self-repairing cities, actually thinking about the world as a more animate place not just the living organisms that are animate, but the buildings and the roads and the bridges, they're going to need 
some way of making calculations, of responding to things. And you might think, well, let's just plug them into our normal computers. But actually, the liquid state offers something else too. It can deliver energy. It can deliver new material to repair a crack. So if you had a network of liquids, it could do many things for you. So I think all in all, liquid computing is really interesting. And it's unclear now of its future, but it's, it's definitely one to watch. Well, finally, Mark, let me ask you about a liquid that is maybe somewhat dangerous uh, in that it can have negative effects, maybe social effects, if not handled properly. Are you, are you ready for this question? Yeah, well then. What is the way to make a proper cup of English tea? Is it the tea first or the milk first? Uh, I understand if you don't get this right, you uh, are put down as a bounder. Well, it's a huge area of contention in Britain and other places. There's a set of people who think it doesn't make any difference. You put the milk in first or the tea in first or the tea in first, the milk in first. Who cares? It, you know, you're mixing two liquids together and that's going to give you the same result. Wrong. Turns out, <laughs> turns out that actually you can taste the difference. So there is a difference between those, the order of, that you put things in. And there are many theories as to what is happening to make the difference. And I won't go into them now because there are a huge amount of literature on them. So the first thing to say, I think, is that I think people should take seriously the fact that some people prefer one over the other. And you should ask them, <laughs> do you want the milk in first or after? And that so rarely happens, Seth. And it absolutely drives me mad. I mean, let's face it, it's probably the most popular drink in the world after water. And yet it's not really treated with the respect that coffee is treated with, where there's a huge amount of reverence about coffee. So I do lament the fact that with tea, we've kind of lost the plot a bit, and it does matter. <laughs> well, Mark Miodovnik, thanks so very much for speaking with us. It's a pleasure. It's been lovely to be on the program. Mark Miodovnik is a professor of materials and society at University College London, and he is the author of Liquid Rules, The Delightful and Dangerous Substances That Flow Through Our Lives. You might come across this liquid on a nature hike. Can you guess what it is? It's actually fairly inoffensive stuff. It's a very wet foam. It's slightly sticky, slightly gooey, and they make it slightly gooey so that it will hold the bubbles better. But who or what is creating bubbles out of this sticky, gooey stuff? That, plus the molten material that makes the Earth's magnetic field move next, if you just go with the flow on Big Picture Science. It works. Well, let's be honest. No one's going to say that about your deodorant, but with Native, you don't have to have any doubts. And Native offers more than just reassurance. It's made with fewer, simpler ingredients. None of that laundry list of strange-sounding compounds you'll find in the chemical handbook. Native has garnered over 7,000 five-star reviews in places like Women's Health, Good Morning America, Nylon, and, well, more. You can get native in pleasant but not overwhelming scents, such as coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, eucalyptus and mint, or, if you're a purist, totally unscented. And a special deal for BiPiSci listeners. 20% off your first purchase if you go to nativedeodorant.com and use promo code BPS, as in big picture science. 20% off. Just mouse over to nativedeodorant.com and use promo code BPS. Native deodorant. Effective and, to be honest, simply better. You think you have indigestion? Our poor Earth's innards are sloshing around like the stomach of a milkshake drinking contestant at a dairy festival. Only in the Earth's case, its liquid interior doesn't cause havoc for adjacent riders on the tilt -a whirl The sloshing does mess with our planet's magnetic field, however. We're talking about the curious properties of liquids whose influence runs through our lives in this episode of Big Picture Science. While our planet's inner core is actually solid, 
Go out a bit to the outer core and you'll find molten iron. And that outer core can wreak havoc on your compass's idea of north. Now recall that the magnetic north pole is not the same as the geographic north pole. The North Magnetic Pole is the point at the Earth's surface where the Earth's magnetic field is exactly vertical. So imagine when you are using a compass, the needle of the compass will align with the direction of the Earth's magnetic field where you are. But if you were uh, exactly at the pole location, then your compass needle would be unable to point anywhere because it would want to point exactly downward. And while the position of Santa's lair remains pretty much in the same spot year after year, the magnetic North Pole is on the move. And it moves by as much as 30 miles, roughly 50 kilometers, a year. Give it a passport. Since the 17th century, we know that it's meandered all over the Canadian Arctic, beginning near Prince of Wales Island and then moving a little bit southeast to the Boothian Peninsula and then turning north. All these are the islands that contain the Northwest Passage, by the way. And now it's leaving our neighbor to the north and is headed to Siberia, across the Arctic Ocean at the top of the globe. However, not all poles that wander are lost. They're just driven by the molten iron core deep inside our planet. The molten iron core generates the Earth's magnetic field. Our planet is a gigantic bar magnet, if you will, one that is responsible for the aurora and the working of compasses. And one of this scientist's tasks is to track it. My name is Arnaud Schulia, and I am a geophysicist at the University of Colorado in Boulder. The Earth has a magnetic field mostly because it has a core which is made mostly of liquid iron and also some nickel. And this liquid core, which is like a gigantic and very deep ocean of liquid metal, is constantly convecting. So imagine, uh, you know, when you are boiling water to cook some eggs, for example, well, there are a lot of flows within the water because it's hot below the water and then it's uh, cold at the surface. It's uh, very much the same thing for the Earth's outer core. It is hotter at the center of the Earth, a place named the inner core, which is solid. And then it is a little bit less hot at the surface of the outer core. So as a result, the outer core is constantly convecting. And this energy, these flows, create the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so it's kind of like a generator, right? I mean, uh, you got moving metal around, and so that produces a magnetic field. Yes, the, the physical principle is close to that. So the magnetic fields are the consequence of the, uh, the sloshing, you know, the, the, the flows of these liquid metals deep within the Earth. Could you give me a description of what it would be like if I could somehow go down there and take a look? I mean, what would the temperature be like? And, you know, how, how thick is that stuff anyhow? Is it like motor oil or is it like peanut butter? What, what's it like? Well, that's a good question. I've never been there myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that would be a very difficult thing to do. Uh, what we know about the core is that it's very hot. It's about 5,000 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's why essentially the, the metal is liquid. But it's also of extremely high pressure. So you have to imagine that uh, if you were to go there, you would have about 3,000 kilometers of rocks on top of your head. So that makes a lot of pressure. And this outer core is convecting at a few kilometers per year. So relatively slowly, if you compare, say, to oceanic flows. But if you compare to, uh, for example, plate tectonics, uh, it's very fast. And so that's the reason why we observe this relatively fast, uh, fast variation of the Earth's magnetic field. How did it get there? I mean, you know, people may wonder, well, how, how did all this hot metal get into the center of our planet? Well, when the Earth formed more than 4 billion years ago, you know, it was a, a mix of uh, many things, including some iron. And because the iron is uh, heavier than the rest, uh, for example, the silicates that constitute a large fraction of the mantle or the crust, well, the iron and some other heavy elements, they ended up falling through the Earth under the, the effect of gravity. So that's how the Earth's core formed. Okay, so the movement of the poles, the reason they're moving is because the motion of the liquid core is changing. I mean, it's sloshing around in slightly different ways. Is that what's causing the North Pole to decide to go to the land of borscht? 
Yes, well, because of the core flows, the Earth's magnetic field is constantly changing. So that's a perfectly normal thing. Now, what's more interesting, and I think caught our attention, is that the North Magnetic Pole used to slowly drift at about 10 kilometers per year throughout the 20th century. And starting in the 1980s, its drift speed increased, so the North Pole started to accelerate. And then there was this sudden acceleration in the 1990s, where the speed reached 55 kilometers per year at the beginning of the 2000s. Arnold, could the flow of metals in Earth's interior actually cause the magnetic field of our planet to go away, to drop to zero for a while? Uh, that's unlikely. What's happened in the past is that there has been some reversals of the Earth's magnetic fields, which means that essentially the North Pole becomes the South Pole and vice versa. For this to happen, you need some profound uh, rearrangements of the structure of the core flows, so the flows within inside the Earth's core. And uh, this is something that is now very well observed in uh, numerical simulations in particular, uh, what these observations and these simulations tell us is that when there is a reversal, the magnetic field doesn't go to zero. It reduces significantly, but there is still a substantial magnetic field. But is it enough of a field to protect us from, you know, all those harmful particles being spat out of the sun? I mean, would it be a dangerous time? I'm, I'm not sure we know, you know, exactly what would be the impact. There would certainly be an impact because the Earth's magnetic field has acts as a shield, protecting us from the solar wind and also some particles coming from outside the solar system, which potentially could uh, could be dangerous not only f for life but also for technological systems, especially satellites in orbit. What about my Boy Scout compass? Is it still going to point north as, <laughs> as the North Magnetic Pole, you know, continues its wanderings? Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, the North Magnetic Pole is its actually very close to the North Pole right now. So your compass would actually work probably better than it would have worked 200 years ago. Okay, well, finally, then are now. The magnetic pole is moving because of the flow of hot stuff deep within the Earth. And I just want to know, is that going to change the best viewing spots for the Aurora Borealis? It could. Having the pole move in itself won't change the location of the auroras. This being said, I mean, the pole is moving uh, and also the entire magnetic field is changing in this region. So I think it's relatively safe to say that, yes, the, the auroras are currently moving up north in Canada. And if the, this magnetic pole drift continues in the next decade or two, they should be more visible in Russia. Arnal Shulia. Thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thanks for having me on. Arnaud Chulia is a geophysicist at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and he's also with the Centers for Environmental Information at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Liquids would not seem ideal material to build predator-proof houses, especially considering what the relatively more durable materials, wood and straw, well, they didn't work out so well for the pigs. But it's all in how you spin it, or spittle it. So a spittle bug is a small insect which feeds on the sap of plant stems, and it produces a frothy mass of spittle that it hides in. If you've ever gone for a walk and seen foamy bubbles on the leaves of plants, you might be looking at a spittlebug fortress. And as any cook knows, whipping up a froth is tricky. So a big part of how spittlebugs work is they have to make this fluid able to hold air bubbles, like when you're whipping egg whites or something like that. So it needs to be able to hold the bubbles without them bursting. Philip Matthews, a comparative physiologist at the University of British Columbia, says this bubble-building behavior benefits both the bugs and their brethren. And many spittle bugs can actually hang out together and all contribute to the same mass of spittle. So you can get blobs of spittle, which are many centimeters across. Reporting in the Journal of Experimental Biology, Dr. Matthews describes how the spittle bugs are able to breathe inside the bubble homes they create for protection during their vulnerable nymph stage. But first, let's consider the properties of their liquid building material. 
it's actually fairly inoffensive stuff. It's a very wet foam, slightly sticky, slightly gooey, and they make it slightly gooey so that it will hold the bubbles better. And like any good experimental biologist, he sampled it, of course. It doesn't actually taste like anything really other than water, just kind of like um, slightly slimy water. Only the liquid is not water. Let's put it this way. If you want to know exactly how a spittlebug makes its bubble home stick, you're in luck. Well, in spittlebugs, it's actually coming out the back end, not out of their mouth. So this is essentially urine, which they're producing. They produce copious amounts of urine, and then they can add a few traces of mucus and stuff to this, which allow them to froth it up into this big mass of what looks like spittle. Well, how, how do the bugs actually do this? How do, how do they make these bubbles? So while they're feeding on this plant sap, they're producing an awful lot of liquid waste. And what they do is they actually start to cover their body in this liquid. And they have a little groove on the underside of their body, which they fill with air. And they can dip their abdomen into the liquid that covers their body. And then they contract their abdomen. And this air-filled groove then pops out a little bubble into the liquid. And by repeating this action over and over again, they can basically pump bubbles into the liquid that surrounds their body. And they can start to build up a massive foam. And by doing this, they can cover themselves in a massive foam within maybe 20 minutes or so. So they can do it really quite rapidly. And the bugs produce a lot of this stuff, I mean, relative to their size, right? Uh, so if we tried to emulate this spittling process, uh, how much urine would a human have to produce to, you know, proportionately produce the same amount of foam? Right. So if you're a meadow spittle bug you're probably excreting around 150 to around 280 times their body mass in fluid every day. And if we were to scale that up to human proportions, we would need to be peeing around 12 liters per minute for a whole day to be excreting fluid at the same rate that these guys do. I think that would be very inconvenient. Oh, yeah. You'd essentially be a 24-7 fire hose. (laughs) Okay. So spittle bug, foam home, but they're really good at it. Well, uh, what's the point? I mean, this is not decorative, right? So it's kind of an interesting and still kind of an open question as to why they do this. Some people have suggested that by covering themselves in a massive wet foam, they can produce a favorable microclimate. So the temperature and the humidity inside the foam is going to be nice and stable for them. But perhaps a more obvious explanation is that it's protection. If they live within this massive wet foam, most of the things that want to come and eat them are probably other little predatory insects and stuff like that. And if a predatory insect blunders into this sticky, wet, massive foam, they're quite likely to drown in it. But the spittle bugs hiding in the middle kept safe then. I see. So it's it's really a defensive perimeter. It seems likely, yeah. Okay, so the spittle bug basically creates its own aquatic environment to protect itself. But I think that one of your questions when you became involved with these guys was how do they breathe under all those frothy bubbles? And before Mm -hmm. you answer that, maybe it strikes me as a somewhat esoteric question, but perhaps you could tell us what prompted you to study these guys in the first place. So I'm interested in the respiratory adaptations of insects because insects have been able to colonize all different kinds of environments. And they've been very good actually at reinvading the aquatic environment because the ancestral insect is terrestrial. It's an air breather. But many different groups of insects have actually successfully reinvaded the aquatic environment and they can even breathe water in some cases. They have actual gills. So my question was a spittle bug is essentially a terrestrial air breathing insect but it produces this aquatic environment around itself, this mixture of water and air, this foamy mass. And so I was interested as to whether or not they could breathe the oxygen that's actually trapped within the tiny bubbles in the spittle mass, or whether or not they still relied on breathing air. And? Um, And it turns out they preferentially snorkel. So they breathe air, but they do so by sticking the tip of their abdomen, so essentially their butt, They stick out of the foamy mass and they will breathe the atmospheric oxygen. So while they're hiding down in the spittle mass, they can be feeding on the plant stem and they keep their posterior out extended through the side of the foam where they can breathe the atmospheric oxygen. Some miniature snorkelers. Okay, do they ever breathe the air trapped within the uh, foam? Uh, So it seems like they do, but it's kind of an emergency measure. So 
presumably spittle bugs occasionally get trapped in their spittle and if they were to drown when that happened that would obviously not be very beneficial to them so it looks like they can actually use the tip of their abdomen to puncture inside the bubbles trapped within the foam and they can consume the oxygen within those bubbles. Well, finally then, how long do they stay in these these, these homes? Do they spend their entire lives in these uh, f- foamy homes? They don't actually. So this is something that they only do while they're juveniles. And a juvenile spittle bug is also called a, a nymph. And so they hatch out in early spring. And over the course of spring, you'll see these blobs of spittle around. But when summer comes, they tend to disappear. And this is because the nymphs grow within this massive foam so they'll shed their skin and they'll get bigger and they'll turn from a spittle bug into another kind the adult form of the insect which is called a frog hopper a, a frog hopper uh, do they hop onto frogs or do they hop with frogs or do they hop as frogs do they hop as frogs do so actually their back legs are, are modified as jumping legs and they tend to walk around only on their two front pairs of legs and their back hind pair they use just for jumping so the adult frog hopper has wings, so it can fly around, so it can obviously disperse to new habitats and find new plants to lay eggs on. Whereas if you're stuck in a spittle mass, you'd probably be essentially trapped in that same region. It's like teenagers, they've got to leave home. Exactly. <laughs> Phil Matthews, thanks so very much for speaking with us. My pleasure. Philip Matthews is a comparative physiologist at the University of British Columbia. Kind of interesting how they turn waste products into defensive uh, uh, structures. I mean, that, that's ingenious. I, I don't see any of my neighbors doing that. Reminds me of the story about the fish that excrete sand and produce those beautiful white sand beaches. Listen, I was just in the South Pacific and uh, wandering through the coral reefs and the, and the sandy beaches, and there was a parrotfish. And I thought, yeah, that fish is making the sand. And so I got out of the water. He was on the beach? No, he wasn't on the beach. He was definitely in the water. But, you know, the water was only like a foot deep. Well, it sounds like parrotfish and spittlebugs get the job done in the end. I guess. They're flush with success. We have another biological liquid coming up. Can you identify it? It carries oxygen to all the places in the body that need oxygen. It's a waste disposal unit, so it also removes things that we don't need, and it keeps us alive. The liquid that is near, dear to, and deep in your heart next, as we go with the flow on Big Picture Science. talking about weird, powerful, and protective properties of liquids in this episode of Big Picture Science, and now we come to one that is essential for life. You may think you can smell it, or perhaps you faint at the sight of it, but nonetheless, your own supply of this stuff may be unfamiliar to you. O negative, A positive, AB negative, B positive. Do you know your own blood type? Most people do not. And yet 9 to 12 pints of the stuff is flowing through your arteries and veins, a collective distance of 12,000 miles a day, says journalist Rose George. And since we've heard what some of the liquids in this episode taste like, what about that distinctive taste of blood? I know what you mean about the taste. I mean, that's the iron. That's the iron in the hemoglobin. The author of Nine Pints, A Journey Through the Money, Medicine, and Mysteries of Blood, Rose George says misunderstandings about blood abound. From persistent stigmas around menstruation to why the use of leeches is not solely a practice of our medieval past. We need blood to live, but what exactly is in it besides those red blood cells that makes it so valuable? Rose George gives us a recipe for blood. So you've got your red blood cells, and they're the ones that give us our strength, and they're the ones that carry the oxygen around the body. Then you've got your white blood cells, and a good way of thinking of these is if you've watched Star Wars, then think of them as kind of nice stormtroopers. So every time the body is threatened with an infection, then your white blood cells will come and attack the invader. So they keep us healthy. We also have plasma, which is also known as the yellow stuff. So that's the 55% liquid portion of blood. That's got lots of really useful proteins and things like immunoglobulin and 
Really, really useful stuff that's also very, very lucrative. So all in all, blood is a very, very useful and efficient liquid. You didn't mention something I learned about in high school called platelets. Are they in there? I did not mention platelets. You're right. They are in there, of course. Platelets are clotters. So when you cut yourself, blood and the body does a pretty amazing thing, which is it clots in exactly the right place and only in that place. So if you injure yourself, you don't want your all your blood to clot. You don't immediately want to turn into a big plug of blood. So your body does what's called a clotting cascade. Some of the actors in that cascade are platelets and they all rush to the scene of the injury and they immediately make blood clot so that you do not lose your blood and then die. Now, Rose, a a, a simple blood test, I mean, to the extent that it's simple, it can tell us a lot about our health. Give me an idea of what sort of things can you learn by, you know, extracting, you know, I don't know, all those cc's of blood and then sending them off to a lab somewhere. There's really too much to answer. There are so many things you can find from blood, and it's really one of the best diagnostic windows really into the body. So that's why when lots of things are wrong with you or you're worried about something, then immediately your physician is going to ask for bloods because a simple blood test can tell us an awful lot about our body and how it's working. What are the physical properties? I mean, uh, is it just as viscous outside the body before it dries up or clots or whatever it does as it is inside our veins and arteries? Well, if you look at red blood cells, for example, um, red blood cells inside the body last for about 142, 143 days. Blood removed from the body, it becomes a more fragile thing. So once blood is outside the body, we need to mix it with things to keep it as healthy and as viscous as it is inside the body. So outside the body, it can have a shelf life of between 37 and 45 days. So obviously that's a lot shorter than the time that red blood cells happily meander around our body or whoosh around our body. Before our modern understanding of blood, I mean, as as we've been discussing here, what, what did people think it was? Well, they thought it was a really magical thing because whenever they saw it, they knew that something really, really bad was generally going to happen. So clearly blood was seen to have this astonishing power because it was associated with injury and death. We understood that if it had this power and if you lost it, you would die, then perhaps if we put it into people, then perhaps we could make them live. I see. So, you know, there's this old idea that there were four humors in the body, you know, phlegm, yellow bile, black bile, and blood. It seems that the ancients were always big on four things. There were four elements in the universe, too. Uh, But that doesn't sound like they really had much understanding of the functions here. Well, I mean, if you look at the humoral way of understanding the body, you're right, there were four humours, but the thing is that three of them you could get rid of quite naturally through various orifices, so you could have, you know, sweat or vomit or whatever. But blood did not naturally emerge from the body, so that's really how humanity decided that bloodletting was a really good idea. And the idea came about that if you removed blood from someone's body to the point where they were ideally still alive at the end of the process, you could balance the humours of the body and therefore put things right that were going wrong in the body. So that was the theory behind, well, bloodletting, which, at least in recent years, was done with leeches. It sounds like a make-work project for leeches. Uh, When did they stop doing that? And was there any indication that it worked? Leeches in particular? Yes. They're still using leeches. Oh. They're not old-fashioned and they haven't died out. They've actually been rehabilitated. So in the in the 18th and 19th century, when bloodletting was a really big deal and you could be treated with bloodletting even for severe blood loss. And there are some famous people who have died from excessive bloodletting, most notably George Washington. So it wasn't always successful. And the leech was seen as a kind of gentler way of getting rid of blood because it wouldn't take that much. And... Also, a leech has a natural anticoagulant, which means that blood can keep flowing. So if you stick a leech on you and then you remove the leech or the leech drops off when it's full, the blood will still keep flowing. So it's kind of efficient and a bit of a bargain to use a leech. You said it's still being used. Where? Routinely in plastic surgery units. um, It's particularly useful in microsurgery. So if, for example, your finger or your nose or your ear has been ripped off for some reason and they want to reattach it, it can be very, very difficult because the blood vessels are so tiny that even if they do reattach the blood vessels, the blood might not flow properly. 
and it will clot and clog and your reattached part might drop off. so in that situation about thirty years ago it was realised that maybe a leech was a good idea and in fact the other day i was at a book festival and i was talking about leeches because i i think they're really fascinating as much as i don't particularly want to have one anywhere near me and a, a woman came up and said she was a nurse and she said oh i applied a leech yesterday and she said it like it was no big deal <laughs> I, I, I guess not i mean they're, they're they're rather docile critters are they not they're really useful critters. I mean, yes, apparently they don't hurt and uh, they're quite polite. They'll just take their fill, which is not that much, and then they'll drop off. The trouble is then that they move. So there have been very many papers in the scientific literature about the problem of leech migration. You can find them up the curtains, in the bathroom, under the bed, anywhere. I see. You, you, you develop a leech infestation. Well, they're not going to breed, they're just going to disappear, so you, you might have to find them. <laughs> well, it sounds like I'd have leeches on the loose. Now, Rose, there was a 2018 film about menstruation called Period, End of Sentence, and it won an Oscar for Best Documentary Short. It explored lifting the stigma surrounding menstruation in rural India. What was the stigma there? Well, it's a present tense. There's still lots of stigma. And it's so profound and so endemic and so widespread that much as I applaud the fact that this film has won the Oscar, I suspect there will be a need for more films in future. The stigma around periods is, is long-standing. It's thousands of years old. If you go back to Pliny, who was a Roman writer and wrote a very famous book of natural history. He was pretty common in what he thought the menstruating woman was, which was essentially this witch. So he wrote this description of how a woman who was on her period could walk through a field of corn and all the insects would drop off the corn and all the trees would be stripped bare. Really amazing. I mean, I, I wish that were true. But this phobia of menstruation continues in parts of the world today. I mean, that's... I think it continues everywhere. It just takes different forms. I mean, if you look at the extreme version in places like Nepal, there is this very unpleasant tradition, in my view, where a girl or a woman who has a period is banished from her own home and has to sleep in a, in an unheated, I'm going to call it a cow shed, but actually the cow sheds were better than the huts that I saw that women were forced to sleep in. Um, she's not allowed to eat with her family. They're not allowed to touch her. She's not allowed to set foot over the threshold of her own family home. Now, that is extreme. But even, for example, in India, there is a widespread belief that if a woman or girl is menstruating, she shouldn't cook because she will pollute the food. And also that she can rot pickles, which is quite astonishing when you consider that a pickle is a vegetable suspended in acid. But these are really widespread stigmas and taboos and they have really nasty effects because sometimes they will stop women and girls being able to do what they want to do, maybe go to school or work or go to temple, not, they're not allowed to worship. So they do have real life effects. You occasionally read about efforts to uh, produce synthetic blood, which would, I suppose, obviate a lot of fears about, uh, you know, the contaminated blood or the trade in blood and so forth and so on. Uh, but as far as I know, we, we still don't have synthetic blood, right? We do, but what we don't have is synthetic blood that is as easily to get and as cheap as the stuff that comes out of someone's arm. So many, many millions of dollars have been spent on trying to get a blood product that is as good as blood. But we haven't yet. But in recent years, a team in the UK has managed to create red blood cells that do seem to work as well as our natural red blood cells in transporting oxygen. So we can make it, but it's very, very expensive. So for now, it's probably only going to be useful in very rare blood conditions where it's often very hard to find a compatible donor. Are there any other interesting areas of scientific or medical research concerning blood that uh, strike you? Oh, all sorts. I mean, I was reading just this morning that, again, here in, in England, that they're working on creating a universal plasma so that you wouldn't have to, in a transfusion, you wouldn't have to have a particular blood group of plasma for a donor, and we would just have a universal plasma. So, yes, it's a very, very dynamic and vivid 
field of research. Lots of people doing really interesting things. Rose George, thanks so very much for speaking with us. You're very welcome. Rose George is a journalist, and she's the author of Nine Pints, A Journey Through the Money, Medicine, and Mysteries of Blood. So what we've heard in this show are some very interesting examples of useful liquids like blood, for example, which is our life force, but also self-healing pavement. We've heard about froth that can protect certain kinds of bugs. I mean, liquids are great because you can pump them, you can pipe them, you can pour them. And I'm just thinking, if the interactive force between molecules was a little different in an alternative universe, that might be a universe without liquids. Man, that would also be a universe without life, at least not as we know it. Liquids are really a sensational state of matter. Thanks to the talented group who keep the show in a state of flow, senior producer Gary Niederhoff, assistant producer Sarah Derwin, and operations manager Barbara Vance. I'm executive producer Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Shostak. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called Go With The Flow. If you want to hear more Big Picture Science, you'll find a cascade of episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you never want to miss an episode, subscribe to BiPiSci on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Radio Pandora, and Himalaya. 